Unitarian Universalism has long been known as a radical faith. The first UU church I belonged to had a tradition of welcoming newcomers with a cake that said, welcome heretics. We generally take pride in calling ourselves heretics because in many ways, we were the original heretics. When Christian creed was being solidified and institutionalized in the fourth and fifth centuries, the two dominant strains that were quashed were the theology of one singular God united with humans through Jesus as God's ultimate messenger and the theology that all human beings would one day be restored and redeemed to God's universal love. In other words, Unitarianism and Universalism. So it's worth knowing that our history is both ancient and radical. Though both certainly helped our growth, we are not an American creation or even a creation of the Protestant Reformation. We were the heretics that Catholicism was defined around. And we're usually pretty proud of this fact, and not because it asserts ourselves as anti-Christian, it doesn't. Our history is rooted in Christianity. I think we're proud of being heretics because of the word itself. Heresy comes from the Greek word that means to choose a school of thought. It's grounded in agency and thoughtfulness. So in many ways, it makes sense that we would wear that title proudly. Over the centuries, we've made it our goal to choose a radical school of thought, one that's in keeping with a changing world around us. We've long called ourselves a progressive faith. And we're a progressive faith not because of politics, but because we choose to progress as the world does. To be ever more inclusive, ever more loving, ever more thoughtful. Because revelation of the universe and the truths it carries is ongoing. Revelation itself progresses. And so does wisdom. We also like to go against the grain. Both Unitarianism and Universalism have their founding in subverting institutional authority and conventional hierarchies in the name of a radical theology that asserted love or unity to be more powerful than conventional understandings of religiosity and authority. I would go a, a step further and say that we are a more accurate reflection for Jesus's intention as the original leader in the subversive theology of love over power, but that's a sermon for another day. Today, I want to explain why Unitarian Universalism needs to be saying that Black Lives Matter. Because Black Lives Matter encompasses the same radical, inclusive, and universal theology subverting authority that we trace our origins back to. But let me back up a little to the history of Black Lives Matter. It was founded by three women, Alicia Garza, Patrice Coulors, and Opal Tometi. In the wake of the murder of 17-year-old Trayvon Martin and the acquittal of George Zimmerman, these three women began a rallying cry that Trayvon was not just some kid in a hoodie to be suspicious about. He was a teenager worth every ounce of protection, love, and life that we wish for any teenager. His life mattered. And yet, when Zimmerman was acquitted after following an unarmed teenager and shooting him for no reason other than that he was Black. It was hard to think that society felt the same way. 
It may have been a new phrase, but it wasn't a new sentiment. Every time someone refers to black folks hanging out on a street corner as a group of thugs, sees the skin color as synonymous with criminal. Every time a white person calls the cops on a black person for existing in a space they don't expect to see them, they're saying black people don't deserve the same freedom and mobility as white people. Every time a black person is stopped by the cops with an assumption of guilt rather than innocence, which our legal system theoretically mandates, they are saying that human worth is tied to the color of your skin. Putting people of color in the position to prove their humanity to police officers. The killing of unarmed black people is not the only part of the Black Lives Matter story. It's the result of institutionalized and internalized dehumanization. And if I were in that position, I'd be screaming myself hoarse, saying my life matters. But I don't need to, because it's already assumed. Hell, I don't think we want to know what the people who break out AR-15s when they can't get a haircut would do if they were legitimately treated as less than human. But that's the point. How many of them were shot despite being heavily armed? How many were beaten? How many were arrested? The answer is zero, zero, and very few. We all know that the protests in the wake of George Floyd's murder have been treated very differently than the protests to open the economy. This is why we say that Black lives matter. Because authorities are saying with their actions that they don't. Black Lives Matter is an intentional subversion of traditional hierarchy and power. It's a theology much like our own that calls for the most vulnerable and disempowered to be prioritized because people who are currently at the party of worth and dignity, enjoying their food and drink, don't need an invitation. I got to come through the VIP section, and that's a problem, because we should all be VIPs. And there should be no arbiter on who has worth and who doesn't. And yet, arbiters are everywhere. In the criminal justice system, in banks, deciding who gets a loan. In the education system. And the reality is that Black lives don't matter to many of these arbiters. So it is incumbent upon those with privilege to wield it and say loudly that Black lives matter. I found myself reflecting a lot in our history. Because in many ways, I know we are living through a historical moment, one that will define us not only as you use, but also as a world. And I keep coming back to a time when Unitarians were unequivocally on the wrong side of history during the abolition movement to end slavery. Many famous Unitarians were slaveholders. But the overwhelming legacy the Unitarian Church left from that era was one of apathy. The one and only UU minister to boldly take a stand against slavery was Theodore Parker. He argued that engaging in the ministry of love and unity should be more important than debating theological semantics. He criticized the fact that the church acted more like a debate club than a ministry to build a just world. One of Parker's arguments against his colleagues was that most of them had the luxury 
to be engaged in intellectual debates about these topics that were all theoretical. Gradualism versus abolition. Debating the importance of debate in the individual spiritual journey. But for the people living through slavery, being separated from their family and killed for trying to escape, this was life or death. This was about a literal freedom, not the freedom of thought that Emerson was often talking about. For trying to call his colleagues to their better angels, for asking them to put black lives before white inconvenience, Parker was shunned. He went on to live a life of true ministry, helping people escape slavery and fighting for women's rights. But it wasn't until the civil rights movement that the Unitarian Church, having merged with Universalism, really began to reckon with over a hundred years of inaction on racial inequality. And we still struggle to reckon with it today. Because we love that we're radical. But let's not be radical for the sake of being radical. We're supposed to be radical in the genuine service of creating the world that everyone deserves to live in. When we claim our heritage as heretics, part of our job is looking at all the times we've put the desire to choose before the emphasis on what the school of thought actually was. The freedom to choose any school of thought before choosing a school of radical inclusivity because putting freedom of thought before freedom to exist will always protect the most powerful. And I think our UU forefathers from the fourth century would be appalled to see history's fight between the freedom to be oppressive and the freedom to exist because they fought the latter and lost. At the time, they were disempowered targets of the emerging power that consolidated within a newfound Christian society. So if we aren't putting the lives of those who are disempowered targets of society at our center, we're missing the point of being a subversive faith. And we're missing the point of our principles and sources. Because when Unitarianism and Universalism merged to create a covenantal faith, rather than a creedal one. That was truly revolutionary because it meant that beliefs were less important than the ministry of justice and inclusion that everyone deserves. That we fought long and hard to be who we are as individuals. So our faith is about how we come together as a community to extend that true freedom outward. A couple weeks ago, I talked about how history isn't a static moment, but a living, moving story that continues to shape and inspire our present. And perhaps nobody embodied that better than Congressman John Lewis. Most of us have seen the photos of him marching alongside Martin Luther King Jr. and the subsequent photos of the beating that he took on Bloody Sunday. But he didn't just fight for civil rights in the 60s. He fought every day of his life. And he reminded us that history is ever present. That the struggle is not a moment, but a lifetime. Five years ago, after Lewis wrote a comic book about his experience with civil rights in the 60s, he went to San Diego's famous Comic-Con the big comic book convention. And there he dressed up as his 25 year old self with the trench coat and the backpack with all the same items he'd placed in his backpack 50 years earlier. And after his panel, he led a large group of third graders on a march around the convention center to say that the struggle 
isn't mine, but ours. It's not back then, it's now. Lewis spent his life getting into what he called good trouble, the kind that courageously puts real freedom and justice before absolutely everything. And he made a rather bold statement about the Black Lives Matter movement in one of his final public appearances. When Black Lives Matter was written in yellow on the DC street alongside the White House, Lewis visited the mural and walked it. Black Lives Matter is an example of how history is still moving us. How the civil rights movement didn't end, but was reshaped in today's world. And we have an opportunity to be a part of that. They are carrying Lewis's legacy onward and they carry our legacy too. Looking at their 13 principles, it is radically inclusive. Their principles center the most vulnerable among them. Immigrants, women, trans siblings, people of all ages, those who are differently abled, and all of their principles are fueled by their first principle for restorative justice. And I want you to hear the words. We are committed to collectively, lovingly and courageously working vigorously for freedom and justice for black people and by extension, all people. As we forge our path, we intentionally build and nurture a beloved community that is bonded together through a beautiful struggle that is restorative, not depleting. The entire movement is grounded in restoration. It doesn't get more universalist than that. We have an opportunity to join a movement that promotes our UU values, that all are worthy, that all should be free, that we as a society can finally be restored and redeemed, but only when all of us are. It may get us into a little bit of trouble, but as John Lewis reminds us, only good trouble really moves us forward. May our good trouble lead to the miracle that is the ongoing struggle for justice. Let's join the miracle. Blessed be and amen.